distribution system valves. Instead of saying blank, I'm going to say these. These are designed to control the flow of water by reacting to changes in the system and automatically opening the valve to compensate. Let's start right here. The control valves. Control valves. This is an example of what they might look like. It has a mechanism, a gear at the top that opens and closes the valve. Number two, the primary purpose of check valves is to prevent, George? C, water from flowing in two directions. Water from flowing in two directions. We want water to flow one way. Remember that our water, once we treat it and goes into the distribution system, it's a known quality. We know the quality of that water. If we're doing our jobs right, and we're going out and sampling and testing, if we're maintaining our distribution system, all the valves and pipes, hydrants, blow-offs, all those meters, water meters, if we're maintaining our system adequately, we can keep that potable water system and the water in it safe. One of those methods that we do this is with a check valve. The check valve allows water to only flow in one direction. As the water flows through the check valve, the way that we want it to move, the valve stays open. If there's a reversal in flow, if the water pulls back, it slams that check shut. It slams it shut and it won't allow water to flow backwards. And that's one of those methods we use to protect the potable water supply. I want you to keep something in mind when it comes to valves. They're named according to the closure element. So every valve has an element inside, and this is a check valve. We have double checks. You'll see a check valve that has two swing checks. It's kind of a backup, right? And then at the bottom of that will be a dump. It's an opening. So if those checks activate, it'll dump water. And as you're driving by or walking by, you can look over and say, hey, that thing's dumping water. Because they're installed 12 to 18 inches above grade. We do that so they'll never be submerged. If they're submerged, they're no good anymore. So if there's a flood event, something like that happens, you want to keep those out of the water. <clears throat> and if it's dumping water, that's an indication that something's wrong, something's failed. That check is activated and it's dumping water. There was a reversal of flow. Okay. Number three, this valve is very efficient in either flow or pressure regulation and is used almost exclusively on pipes four inches in diameter or smaller. Water flow is stopped as the disc is lowered onto the seat. You see? C, globe valve. Globe valve. And you can see the closure element, they call that a globe. So as the water's flowing through, it has to flow through and that globe, if it's open, allows the water to continue on. So it goes like a U-shape kind of? Yes, it's, uh, it's rounded. Mm -hmm. at the, the closure element is rounded and, and, and squeezes down onto a seat. Number four, valves should be completely <coughs> closed and then reopened at least. Did it I? We call that exercising our valves, and yes. it should be done D annually. It should be done annually. Ideally, we want to do this annually. Now, we, that's what we should be doing. That's what's recommended by the manufacturer. And very often times with a piece of equipment, we always look at the uh, manufacturer recommendations, and we want to meet that. That's the goal. The requirement, the regulation is 20% of our system a year, which means everyone gets touched at least once every five years. You know, we have a very large system here. I forget how many thousands of isolation valves that we have out there in the system. To touch every one of them every year, it would take the addition of maybe two crews of two men, with each with a valve truck. We have a very expensive valve truck um, to go out and hit every isolation valve five days a week, 40 hours a week 
to go out and exercise every bout every year. But part of our job is to be efficient. So we're trying to balance between what's recommended by the manufacturer and what is actually doable. If we can do our entire system in two years or three years, we feel pretty good about that. If we, if we have to stretch it out to five years, we're within the regulation. Ideally, you want to be out there every year touching that valve. And what we mean by that is taking the valve truck out there, putting the, rotating the arm out that has the valve wrench, right, that long stem. So you open that valve cap, you can see the valve down there is probably two feet down, maybe nine, ten feet down, some of them are even deeper than that. You drop it onto the operating nut at the top of the valve, and we have the computer that starts to turn the valve. Very small turns at first, close, open, close, open, and then it exercises it. And what that's doing is you have the that uh, that stem that has the um, <clears throat> the grooves on it like a screw, right? So we're opening, closing. We're knocking off any kind of rust or debris that might be there, and then over. The next few minutes, it opens it and closes it in more and more turns until it's closing it all the way and opening it all the way, exercising the entire stem and the gate, making sure that no debris is getting stuck in the seat and keeping that valve from leaking, allowing water to leak past. Yeah. Number five, this valve has a hinged flap or disc which opens in the direction of normal flow and shuts when the flow reverses in the opposite direction of normal flow. And that would be a check valve. It's a check valve. You're gonna get a lot of the same questions, but asked in different ways. That's why in these study guides, we're answering the same question over and over again, but pay attention to the wording. We're doing that because when you go to take your certification exam, it's not always gonna ask the question directly. It's gonna find some other way of asking that question from a different perspective, let's say. And it just wants you to think about it. It wants you to think about these different perspectives of how these valves operate or other subjects that we have. Number six, valves may be classified or named according to the movement of the closing, the closure element. The movement of the closure element, D. Number seven, the least amount of head loss in a pipeline would be the result of a fully open, Adrian? C, gate valve. Gate valve. That gate moves up and down. <clears throat> this is the operating nut. You can have a rising stem or a non-rising stem. When the gate valve or the valve is below grade, below ground level, you want a non-rising stem. A non-rising stem is one that won't rise up yeah. outside or these types of valves that are outside and above ground. Very often you'll see a rising stem, so you have a long stem that's on a gate and you can actually see it through a sight glass. You can see the stem moving up and down as the gate opens and closes. Inside here we have the large gate and that gate will slide up and down to open and close. There's different types of gate valves. One of those gate valves has a gate that has wedged sides. And with those wedged sides, it's a more, as you close it, it locks that gate in place and closes and isolates that section of pipe. And those types of gate valves, while gate valves typically aren't used to throttle flows, they're not made for that because the flow of water actually degrades the sides of the gates, making them less effective. So we don't really want to throttle flows with them. We do, but we don't want to. That's not, um, in those situations, we're changing those out with plug valves. Plugs are more effective at throttling flow, but the gate valves with the wedged sides or the wedged closer element is, it can be used for throttling flows. Just keep that in mind. Do you know what type of valve that is? <clears throat> no. On the closure element or for the gate valve itself, the yellow that's around it, everybody calls that an alpha gate valve. 
Brett, you want to explain that real fast? Yeah, so what we're what Brian's talking about is the maker and the type of valve this is. This is a gate valve, but we call this an alpha. It's made by Romax. So what this does is if we have an emergency, a line break, or a valve that fails, and we gotta get in there and fix it because it's fully shut or fully open and it's and we have an emergency and we need to change out that valve. We can excavate the area, get down in there. Hopefully we have good isolation valves upstream and downstream of this valve. We can cut it out and then put in new pieces of pipe. And what this does is it has one nut instead of eight or 12, six, eight or 12, I think it is. Uh, it just has the one. So we slide that on, we get the other side uh, built up and then we slide it back over. We get it centered so the pipe on either side is, is where they're supposed to be placed. And then you tighten up this nut right here and it tightens up everything around the pipe equally. The pressure is equal around. So if you have a flanged, <clears throat> before this technology, you had a flange and it had six, eight, 12, bolts and nuts. Yeah, with a brake wing, right? Yeah, so, exactly. So, then you had to take the time to tighten them all in a proper sequence, like a star. Mm -hmm. You're constantly moving around. Once you get them all tight, then you have to go through and check the torque with a torque wrench. And you had to do that on both sides. Now that could take, just doing that alone, that could take 45 minutes. And you, when you're in an emergency situation, That's you need to get that operational again that's forever. And trust me, as the guy in charge observing this, as the guys that are in the trench are working on this, you're sweating, right? As the supervisor, as the person in charge of making sure everything's going the way it's supposed to go, number one, my primary concern is everybody's safety. That's why I haven't gotten my hands dirty in several years. You know, I'm not supposed to pick up a tool. When I'm on site, there's a crew working, my first responsibility is to make sure that everything is happening safely. I don't want anybody getting hurt. I don't even want to break a nail, right? So that's my first job. My second job is to understand how the work is affecting our system and our ability to deliver water to our customers and keep that water safe to protect the water supply. So I have to think about all these things and so here's a little key. When you see me at a project and we're under, we're, we're on a timer, we're on the clock, we, we've got to get this done. Very often I see those guys that are actually doing the work and they're, they're tightening up the bolts and they know it's taking a while, especially on those flanged units, which are great, they're good, but it takes forever to get all those things tight and put together and, and, uh, and, we, and we have to finish before we can recharge that line. Because <clears throat> once we recharge the line, we're looking for leaks, and we don't want anybody in the trench when that thing is recharged, just in case something blows out. One little mistake can cause a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. well, but when those guys are right in the middle of that, and they know we're on the clock, and we know we need to get water moving through this valve, and they turn and look at me, they're looking to see, am I stressed? Am I worried? Am I angry? Am I frustrated? If you exhibit any of those attitudes, it's going to affect the performance of the people that are working for you. A mistake will be made. And it puts everybody on the edge. What they need to see from you, if you're the guy that's in that position, is you're calm. You know, I'll very often look at them and just say, hey, you're doing a good job. Let's just do the next thing. You wanna make sure that he has confidence in what he's doing. And the people at grade or at the edge doing the edge work, they're anticipating what that guy needs or those two guys in the trench need. Are they gonna need a wrench? Are they gonna need a sawzall? Are they gonna need a torque wrench? What do they need next? Do they need water? Mm. I mean, consider our summers here. Horrible. Ground level, ambient air temperature might be well over 120 degrees. Thermometer might say it's 110, but really, in the sunlight, in the direct sun, in the middle of the day, at ground level, it might be 120 plus. And you have those two guys in the trench or the one guy in a trench and there might be five, six guys standing around that trench watching them. 
anticipating what he needs. What tools do you need? But we got constantly, the, 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 there should always be, what do you need? And because we're anticipating what he needs, the tool is right there, ready to go. The equipment's right there, the, the pipe, the valve, everybody's ready to go. Everybody's paying attention to what that one guy is doing. And that, the question should be asked every five, 10 minutes. It's, do you need water? And if you don't ask the question, it should be, hey man, here's a bottle of water. Yeah, let's throw it down to him. We have cases and cases and cases of these bottles of water. And sometimes you'll get those guys that'll be like, no, I don't need it. That's when you stop asking them if he needs water. You just give it to him. Mm -hmm. Here, man, drink this. And even though you're on the clock, even though you're under pressure, make sure that guy has water. And if you need to, you rotate him out. Always have somebody fresh, ready to go, that can jump in there and take his place. You want to constantly rotate that guy out. So with all that said, Brian brought this up. It was a really good question. What type of, who makes this valve? It's Romax. It's an alpha. It's an alpha gate valve. They make alpha couplings. We use a lot of those because unfortunately in this system, it was owned by a utility before us that didn't really maintain their system, didn't build it very well. And we've had a lot of problems with pipe splitting underground because of poor backfill. That's another video of some other day. Mm -hmm. But because we experienced that on forced mains <clears throat> and water mains, these Romax alpha couplings, and they're not sponsoring me. <laughs> yeah. So we're selling a product we're not getting paid to promote. Thanks a lot, Brian. Well, <laughs> but they are really quick. It so shortens that 40 minute, 45 minutes down to to five minutes. Five minutes, ten minutes. So simplify it. It's a, an industrial hose clamp. Oh, pretty much, yeah. yeah. And that exact one that would be a gate out valve. Which, yes, the gate. if you don't have a isolation valve in between a certain amount of distance, you can install one of those, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've done that quite a few times where we had a line break. And so whenever we have a line break, one of the things that we're doing to prepare to make the um, <clears throat> the repair is we're looking for an isolation valve upstream where the water's coming from, and we look for an isolation valve downstream where the water's going. Depending on the elevation, one side might be higher than the other. And when we go to make a repair, we don't want all the water in the entire line to drain out. We'll isolate on either side. That'll narrow down how much water is in the pipe that we have to get rid of before we can make the repair. That's why we have hydrovac trucks or vacuum trucks, pumper trucks. Once the pipe is cut, we'll make a small cut first to relieve the pressure. So before we cut the pipe, we'll isolate upstream and downstream. And then we will <clears throat> make the cut, relieve the pressure off the main or off the pipe. Once we relieve the pressure and we have a vacuum sucking out all the water that's coming out and starting to fill the trench, then we'll start to make deeper cuts and open that pipe up so we can back out or pump out the water that's in the pipe and then make our final cuts, measure that, and build what we're gonna replace it with, the valve and the ends of the pipe that need to go in there. It's a lot of fun, I love this job. Okay, number eight. When a valve will not close by using the hand wheel, use a cheater bar. Adrian, what do you think? Be false. False, don't use a cheater bar. What a cheater bar is is, you have the handle of the valve and you can't get it to budge. So you stick a piece of pipe on there, like ductile iron, some type of heavy material, and that gives you more leverage. You know, if you have leverage, you can move tonnage, just one guy. If you have the proper tonnage or the proper leverage, you can move a two pound boulder. The problem with that is, is you can break this. You can break the stem. And if you break the stem, now your valve is stuck. So what we do when we encounter a stuck valve is we get the valve truck over there, put it on there, and we in slowly and incrementally increase the torque. And once we get to a certain level, we stop. If it won't budge at a certain level, we say, all right, we're gonna have to replace this. And it's a very expensive, very expensive, very costly repair because typically these things are under asphalt in a roadway that's gonna require chop control. 
So you have to do a boost stake, call in all the utilities and boost stake, get a permit from the county or the town or the city or wherever you're at to make sure that you can set up traffic control. Uh, you have to present that plan and get that approved. And that's if this is a non-emergency. If it's an emergency, you have to call an emergency boost stake. All the utilities have three hours to come out and mark everything. Um, you set up your temporary traffic control. Then you cut the asphalt or the concrete or both. You have to remove that and start excavating, get down to where the break is, make the repair, and then get out of there. So if a $5,000 gate valve, some of these are two, three thousand dollars each. That valve to replace it can really quickly become twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar job, and it goes up from there. Mm -hmm. And that's what you guys don't get to see. On my end, I get to see the invoice, and I have yeah. to justify it before I approve it. And then it goes on to somebody a little bit higher than me, who has to approve my approval. <laughs> <laughs> And before they do that, how many questions do you think they ask? Uh, 20 or 30. I have to be ready to answer every question to be able to justify that work. Fortunate that we work for a company that understands yeah. very easily. Very, it doesn't take, I don't have to sweat. Mm. You know, they understand. I mean, not to say I haven't had to sweat a few times because I've made poor decisions. It's cost us money, cost our repairs money. And we're very, very sensitive to that. Never use a cheater bar. No. Number nine. <clears throat> oh, I did a poor job of that. What is the most common type of valve found in water distribution systems? I mean, ball or plug. Ball See? or plug. This is an angle stop. The service connection. The valve is a quarter turn. We have one of these at every water meter. Every water meter in our system has one of these. It's either a ball valve or a plug valve. These are ball valves. So... Ball valves, plug valves are the most common types of valves in our system. Distribution system. Hmm. Number 10, which valve can be opened and closed with a quarter turn? The both, B and C. B and C. So a gate valve takes several turns. Ball or plug valve, that's a quarter turn. Butterfly valve, a quarter turn. Very good. And that's it. That's the end of that. And that's just the beginning of valves. Yeah. There's going to be more videos coming down the line, especially as we move up to grade three, grade fours. That's going to talk more extensively about valves. Um, I have plans to get out in the system, get valves right in front of us, and demonstrate what they look like, how they work, what they are, what they do. If you've gone to my website and purchased the study material, you're going to get more in-depth information. And that'll lead you to research. You know, I like to use YouTube. I like to use Google. I like to go to the resources that I have available to me, the Ragsdale Water and Distribution System Operators Manual, the uh, Sacramento Manuals. That's University of California, Sacramento, with their manuals, their guides. Uh, and there's all sorts of other resources, textbooks and information that you can get, study material that you can get. I have it all and I use it all.